Hi, my name is Diana Chavez. Thank you for joining our webinar. Sunray secures 10 billion annually for GC subs and suppliers. We're a national construction document service. Today we have a great webinar on what happens after I record my lien, how do I get paid in New Jersey? By construction lien law expert, Joshua Quinn. So without further ado, please, uh, Joshua, take it away. Thanks, Diana. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share some information this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about the process a little bit, uh, a little bit about proofs and, and some practicalities in the process of what happens after you file a construction lien uh, or a municipal mechanics lien in New Jersey. So at the outset, um, here's a little bit of information. If you want to submit a question along the way, um, feel free to do that. I'll do my best to keep an eye on things and, and answer the question if it's, a, if, uh, if it's possible. Um, Couple, couple sort of baseline things. Uh, number one, um, keep in mind that what a construction lien is, and I'm going to talk about two different kinds of liens because New Jersey is a unique animal in that it has two different kinds of liens. Uh, the construction lien is nothing more than prejudgment attachment. What that effectively means is it gives you the attachment to the real estate that you otherwise might not be able to get unless and until you file an, a, a lawsuit and you get a judgment after a trial or a summary judgment motion, something of that sort. Um, so it's a unique animal um, that gives you some remedy that you wouldn't otherwise have, which is why a lot of people like to use them because they can create leverage. Once your lien is filed, the law requires you to do something more in order to force a payment situation um, in terms of the court intervention piece. So what are the three kind of buckets that things can, that things can drop into? The first is you file your lien and you just let it sit. Um, this can have value. It's often a financial uh, element to that when you decide to do that. Uh, oftentimes, I've had clients that will file a construction lien and say, okay, well, let's let it sit there for a little bit and, and, and see what happens. Now, you do have to keep in mind the statute provides um, on the back end a certain amount of time in which you have to file your lawsuit to enforce. So you can't, in theory, you can't let it sit indefinitely. Uh, but it can be a valuable tool to just kind of file it, let it sit, and see what happens. Um, and as I said, that's often driven by financial considerations. If, you're, if your lien is worth $15,000 and you're going to spend well over that to force it, you might just want to let it sit for a while and see if it has some impact. Um, the, the second thing would be to file a, 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 a litigation to enforce that lien. Um, that is a complaint. It is filed in court. Um, and then the third, the third option would be to bring a breach of contract action, which is separate and apart from a lien action. So here again is there's a little bit of a, um, of a difference um, as it relates to New Jersey as compared to other states. So New Jersey it has a concept in its laws called the entire controversy doctrine. Uh, and what that effectively stands for in practical terms is that if you're going to bring a lawsuit, um, in state court, you have to bring all your claims in one suit. So um, unlike other states, I'll use Pennsylvania, which is another state I practice in as an example. Um, not only do you not bring your mechanics lien claim in the same case as your, um, as your breach of contract action by, rules of, by the rules of civil procedure in Pennsylvania, you're not allowed to do that because there's jurisdictional differences. One is in REM jurisdiction, the other is in persona. Uh, in New Jersey, however, there's a, a court rule, uh, in, it's in the case law that says you have to bring them in the same case. All the claims, all the parties relative to a specific project and dispute must be brought in one action. And um, there is other case law out there on the entire controversy doctrine in New Jersey that says if you do that, if you don't do that and you fail to achieve your remedy, you can't go back, you can't circle back around again later and try, try it under a different theory got to do it all at one time. So something to keep in mind as you think through the practical realities of what you do after your lien's filed. Um, a little bit of a primer on process here. Um, the construction um, lien attaches to the real estate. Um, and uh, what that does is it, it, it encumbers the real estate in much the same way as a mortgage might. And we'll get into that here in a second. The second kind of lien is, is what we call a municipal mechanics lien, and this one is a little different. I've mentioned this in a couple of prior programs. 
it is used um, on uh, municipal projects um, and it is uh, something that attaches to the funds held by the owner to pay the contractors on that particular job. So in one instance, the construction lien attaches to real estate. In the other instance, it attaches to the uh, to a pot of money. Now, quick quick side note: um, if you file a municipal mechanics lien and that pot is empty, then your lien obviously doesn't attach to anything, and it's it's not a lot of value in it. Um, so uh, there are differences. I like to mention the municipal mechanics liens because they're often a a, a good uh, tool to use in New Jersey that that a lot of folks don't remember is out there. Um, so why do we file? You might be saying, well, why do we file uh, construction liens? Um, construction liens create practical problems um, that at the outset, if you just, for example, are going to let it sit, um, can, can drive discussions short of litigation because of that cloud it creates on real estate, right? If, you ha if you're the owner of the property, particularly if you're the owner of the property um, and your contract is not with the party who, who has filed the lien, um, you know, it, it often catches you off guard because uh, you don't necessarily know what's going on with the subcontractors. And when that lien shows up, it causes a lot of questions to be asked. And, and um, the, the reality of it is that when that lien is on your property as an owner, it makes that property hard, harder to sell. And not all the time, but a lot of times when someone's developing a property, they're developing it to sell it on. Right. Think of your classic residential construction project where you're putting up you know, a subdivision with 100 homes, you know, liens start to show up. That makes it hard to sell the homes once they're built. Um, you know, you're in a commercial setting, you're building an office building, and uh, you're going to lease that premises, or you're going to have to refinance the, the building after the construction's done. Harder to do that if there's a lien on the property. Um, the next sort of practical reality that often um, can create a lot of problems is when when a construction lien gets filed against the property. It's a it's a technically in most instances, which is to say more than 90% of the time, a violation of the of any mortgage or or financing that's on that has a security interest in that property. Uh, you, they're just it's just not allowed to happen under those documents. Um, and then the last piece is it it just doesn't look bad to it doesn't look good to investors. Um, it just looks bad. Um, so you know, there's sort of those practical realities which can often drive someone to come to the table. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen every time, but it's not unusual for me to file a lien and the owner comes to talk to me and says, so what do I got to do to get the lien removed? And I say, okay, well, let's work together and my guy has to get paid and then we'll be happy to take it off. Um, so it, it just, it creates those sort of practical problems that sometimes can get rid of the, the problem without having to file the lawsuit. Um, the municipal mechanics lien claims, I'm not going to dive those much deeper other than what I already said. Uh, you have a similar uh, practical dilemma for the owner, um, which is generally created um, for, the, uh, for the contractor, right? That's where it has the most impact in that setting. If, if you're a subcontractor and you file a municipal mechanics lien and you freeze that pot of money, all of a sudden the contractor can't ignore you any longer. They have to deal with you because their money's tied up and they can't get paid till they deal with you. Um, so you can see where that, in, you know, it is a narrow set of circumstances where you can use it, but where you can, it's a very powerful tool. Um, in terms of what you're going to do, uh, if you have to enforce the lien, you're going to have to file a complaint. Uh, and that's true whether you're filing on a construction lien or whether it's a municipal mechanics lien. And the key thing here is, uh, keep in mind, it is in fact the initiation of a lawsuit. Um, and, and it's not, you know, oftentimes folks think you file a lien and, and it all gets talked about and that's it. And the leverage gets created and dollars show up. That's not always the case. Uh, a lot of times you have to go ahead and file that lawsuit, uh, because from a practical perspective, a lien makes people unhappy, but it doesn't necessarily make them have to do anything until they're ready to have it removed. Um, if you file a lawsuit, think of, uh, a, of a situation where you might have a lawsuit filed against you. You have no choice. You have to defend it uh, or there's a default judgment entered. Um, so a, a lot of times you'll have to go ahead and file that lawsuit, uh, initiate your complaint, and keep in mind the entire controversy doctrine is, is sitting there in the background. So you're probably going to have to bring it with a breach of contract claim. Um, and you get all the, uh, if, if I can use the word, the accoutrements of, uh, 
of bringing a lawsuit. Um, you you, know, you got to you got to file your pleadings. You might have some motion practice. Uh, you're going to have discovery, which means written discovery and document reviews and uh, de possibly depositions and probably experts. Um, so I, I mention all of that because um, it's important to understand while liens are very powerful tools, they are not necessarily cure-alls. You do have to spend some money and it does take some time in order to get through the end of that process. Um, what are the differences in your proofs? Um, to prove a lien claim, um, as a general proposition, you have to show two things. You have to show that, that, you did, that you did the work you say you did, and you have to show that that work was incorporated into the project. Pretty easy proofs. And, and what is, should be conspicuous by his absence in that description is the existence of a contract. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of liens. Uh, the, the theory behind construction liens is that if I add value to an owner's property and I don't get paid for it, I should be able to file a lien until I get paid. Now, you might be saying, well, uh, does that mean I can just walk onto any property, add $10,000 worth of value, and then lien it? Uh, no. I mean, you, you don't have to prove in an academic sense there's a contract, but you are going to have to show some kind of nexus that that work was requested. Um, and you can't just sort of wander around and, and you know, for example, go cut somebody's grass and then, and then file a case, because even if they didn't ask you to do it. So there is that element to it, but it is a much simpler proof pattern from a lawyer's perspective. Conversely, with a contract, you have to show the existence of a contract. You have to show that that, that contract was breached, more specifically, what terms were breached. Um, you got to show that that breach caused, uh, caused you uh, the final element damages. So there's a lot more they have to prove, um, and that may sound like it's a, a difference without a distinction. But from a practical perspective, as an attorney, they're, they're, the proofs are, you know, they're a little more involved. I won't say they're more complicated, but they're a little more involved. So that it's a little bit heavier to lift on a contract. Um, when you when you go to enforce your liens, the central issue is it says that the second bullet point really is typically uh, it centers on arguments of defective and untimely uh, workmanship. And, and for anyone that's uh, ever had to go through this exercise, that usually requires an expert. And, and I say that because, again, it's important to recognize the practicalities and that there is some cost associated with it. Um, here's, a, here's a difference that, that comes into play because of the, the nature of the jurisdiction. Um, with a lien case, um, you know, a, a claim by the defendant or the respondent, depending on what terminology you want to use, uh, to defective and untimely work. It is, a, it is an affirmative defense, uh, which means it is what, what I will loosely call a blocking action. Uh, it means I don't have to pay you, is, is the short version. When you make those same defective or untimely workmanship arguments in a contract case, it is an affirmative counterclaim which effectively means that I can, I can create a scenario where not only do I not have to pay you, you might have to pay me. Um, so that's a pretty big distinction. Um, that is generally based on the idea that, um, as I said, in REM jurisdiction for liens, meaning the jurisdiction is based on the property. Um, the court has jurisdiction over the property, so to speak. And the contract action is in persona, which means that the, the court has jurisdiction over the people involved. So I don't think we want to go too far down that rabbit hole because it's a very legal, legally academic argument and, and um, issue. Uh, but keep in mind that there is a little bit of a proof difference there. Um, the, 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 the parties are generally going to be uh, overlapping, meaning you, know, you, you may have um, an owner in a case where you have a lien. Uh, if you're a sub, for example, if you don't, if you choose not to pursue the lien, then the owner won't be in the case. Uh, in almost every instance, the contract, if you're the sub, the contractor will be. And of course, if you're the contractor not getting paid or you have a sub not getting paid, you're going to be in no matter what. Um, uh, a quick a quick uh, note on uh, what I put in quotes there, bonding off liens. And I, I put it in quotes because it can be done in a couple different ways. It's not always a posting of a bond. Sometimes it's posting a cash collateral with the court or other methods that can be provided. Um, the proofs in those situations when the lien gets bonded off the property, they don't change. 
uh, you still have to prove that you provided the work and that it was incorporated into the project. The remedy is a little different because if it's if it's quote unquote bonded off, then your remedy would be to get cash from the you know the, the cash collateral posted with the court or the bond, whatever the case may be. Um, if you don't have it bonded off and that lien is still attached to the real estate, well now it's different. There's another step. That property has to be put up for sheriff's sale, um, and that property. Uh, th that process could be troublesome depending on where you fall in the pecking order because let's say your lien is worth $50,000, the property's worth a million dollars and there's a million dollar loan on the property that was there before you filed your lien. Um, when that property goes up for sheriff sale, practically speaking, it's probably not going to sell for a million bucks. The first lien holder, the million dollar note uh, from the bank is going to get paid first and once that money washes out, it doesn't matter. Uh, that you didn't get paid, you know, you're fresh out of luck. So you always want to check that when you start chasing liens is make sure, you know, what's what's your pro position in the priority list and what are the dollars and cents involved? Because if you get all the way to the end, you put that thing up for share sale and there's not enough equity in the property because you're too far to pay you because you're too far down, that can create a problem for you. Um, attorney's fees, I, I put this one in here because I always get this question. Um, keep in mind that with liens, you generally can't recover your attorney's fees as a matter, as a general proposition, New Jersey and every other state, you can only get your attorney's fees if it's provided for in the contract or by statute. Um, New Jersey is is the rule. It is not one of the exceptions. The, the lien law does not provide for the recovery of attorney's fees when you go to enforce your lien. Um, the prompt payment statute in New Jersey is a little bit weak. It doesn't provide you a lot of help. Um, in your contract action. So here's the moral of the story. Make sure your contract provides for the recovery of attorney's fees and costs. Uh, that will get you your opportunity to recover that. It's, it needs to be worded in a very specific way. So talk to an attorney um, about getting that language correct. And keep in mind, you cannot lean for the attorney's fees. You can uh, arguably, if your contract is set up properly, uh, chase your attorney's fees in the lawsuit to enforce your lien if it's crafted properly. Some, um, in closing, some practical considerations. Um, cost. Um, consider the amount that you're owed and which remedy, remedy gives you the biggest impact. Um, liens are wonderful tools. Uh, they're not always the best option because you can't often recover your attorney's fees and if your lien isn't, isn't of sufficient value, or you're not high enough up in what we'll loosely call the order of priority um, on the liens on the property, it can it, it can cause you to get lost in all the white noise around projects. Uh, doesn't really have the impact. Um, and liens, it, it takes time to get through that process um, to uh, to get to the end because you know, particularly if if you're um, a smaller fish in that metaphorical pond, you're not going to get the attention, right? So if you're if you if you've got a construction lien on a two million dollar job and your lien's for a million bucks, you're going to have everybody's attention real quick. If you're on a similar job and your lien's for twenty five thousand dollars and there's three other people in front of you, you're just not going to be the priority. So you might want to think of a different way to leverage your situation. Um, the next practical consideration are the proofs. And, you know how complicated are your proofs? Um, it, whether you're approving, hey, I did the work and it was incorporated into the project, generally pretty easy. Um, uh, or uh, do I have to prove that I had a contract, you know, the, the, that I provided the work, so on and so forth. Uh, the tricky elements usually come in with the counter arguments on defective work and, and, and delivery time. You know, were you late or were you on time? Um, because if you're going to have that fight, uh, the way those proofs set up is important. And in some instances, uh, you may prefer to just leave the contract action on the side because it makes it too complicated. Um, and um, and just go the, the route of the lien because the proofs are easier. In other instances, uh, you, you may choose to go the opposite direction. So you want to look at what the proofs require. You want to look at the practical circumstances you're dealing with on your job and figure out what's your best strategy. Uh, and, then the, and then the last thing is um, relationships, and this often gets lost in the shuffle. Um, liens and contract liens, but particularly liens, 
create a negative impact. That's what they're precisely designed to do. Um, and, and they can require arguments that will make people unhappy. Um, and unhappy people impact relationships. So, you know, I've had situations where, you know, have, after having conversations with the client, um, you know, it's somebody that, that knows a specific owner, for example, you know, is going to have another project in about six months that's going to be worth three times what they're getting paid on the current job. And they just decide, you know what, I, I'm not going to sour the relationship with the, with the owner on this one uh, by filing a lien. It's just going to irritate them and they're going to be less inclined to let me participate in the next project. And that's a completely legitimate business decision to make if you've considered all the, all the ramifications of that, right? And, and if your lien you're foregoing is worth $25,000, you might view that a little differently than if you add a couple zeros to it, um, you know, what it means to your company. So be thoughtful about who you choose to fight with and whether it's going to impact that relationship, whether that relates to future work, uh, whether it relates to, you know, your, your um, standing in the industry, whatever it might be. So you just want to be cognizant of that. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the information I have for you this morning. I appreciate everybody's time um, and a willingness to listen and Unless there's any questions, uh, there's my contact information along with Diana's, and I'll turn it back over to Diana. Hi, Joshua. I do not see any questions at the moment, but yes, please feel free to send us an email or give us a call if you have any questions or any interest. All right. I well, think thank that you, was everybody. close. Yes, thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you, everybody, and have a sunny day. Take care, everybody.